welcome to Louis Philippe in pursuit of excellence. My guest today needs absolutely no introduction if you're a sports or a tennis fan. He's easily the greatest player to have ever played the game of tennis. And I'm proud to have played during his era as well. The great Rod Laver. Rod, great to see you. Thank you. You're looking well, look like you just came off the golf course. <laughs> it's a golf shirt, but <laughs> the course I've, yeah, I still, still enjoy playing the game and it's fun to get out there and have a few friendly bets with Charlie yes. Passerelle, Cliff Drysdale. See you every once in a while out there. Yes. So. Came away from Wimbledon, you've seen, uh, you go to some of the major tournaments. Obviously, tennis has changed so much, we're going to talk about it. But when we look back at your career and uh, the great names, Roy Emerson and eventually John Newcomb and Tony Roach and all those guys, did that much of excellence in tennis at that time in Australia push you to be better? I think that's probably a motivational you know, way of looking at it. You know, when you've got uh, the likes of Frank Sedgman and then Hode and Rosewall, that I idled Lou Hode. So, you know, when you look at that level, and then of course you go through with the next group of players, you know, whether it be Roy Emerson, Fred Stolle, then John Newcomb, Tony Roach, you know, I think it does push you. And of course we were all together. I think that's the, that's the one thing that maybe did help everybody that you keep being pushed because, you know, Roy Emerson isn't gonna, isn't gonna lay down at 6-1 in practice. And, and so you work out. And so I think that was, one of the, the great things that Australia has had over the past you know, 30, 40 years. When you look back at those golden years of Australian tennis and uh, the great Harry Hoffman and uh, your first coach when he came out of Rockhampton, and, uh -huh. which is why you're called Rockhampton Rocket. <laughs> but uh, uh, when you look back at those golden years, what stands out most for you? Is it the ability to be pushed by the great players alongside yourself? Probably, I mean, it's just the love of the game. And, and my parents played. I have a two older brothers that uh, played very well in their own right. You know, I was, I was 12, 13. They're up there in the uh, 17, 18. And I'd have to try and get one of them home from work earlier than the other one. You know, then I could practice for maybe 20 minutes, half an hour. Then they both come on and say, off, it, off, the, <laughs> off the court, kid. And, and then, of course, my outlet, only outlet was to run upstairs, get my mother to come back down and we played doubles. And of course, I was on the blacklist for quite a while after that particular session, so. Interesting. When, uh, would you say, uh, obviously, uh, Roy Emerson was probably closest to you, the traveling partner and so on, Neil Fraser, you went on to beat later on to win the Australian <coughs> Open. But when you look back at those golden years of Australian tennis, right before tennis went open, uh, how different was it, amateur tennis at that time and open tennis? Very different. Yeah, there was, there was never the, 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 the I've got to win attitude. When you're playing amateur tennis, the best you're going to get is a trophy. And, and there's no money in it other than an appearance money, which is nominal just to get you around the, around the world circuit. But I think, uh, yeah, Roy Emerson and I were close friends and we, we did play a lot of the finals. You know, Roy and I seemed like we kept pushing each other. Well, you know, anywhere in the world, we were always, you know, in the semi-final or finals. When I came back to the Open Tennis in 68, you know, all of a sudden they said, what happened? You're a different player now. And, and I said, I had to be because I'm get, when, when you, get, you get beaten all the time, you learn fairly quickly some of the things you're doing wrong. So I cut out expense, a lot of the, 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 you know, ex the, the mistakes that I made. My, my second serve had to be better. I had to put volley deeper. My ground strokes had to be better. <laughs> All of it yes. had to improve. And so that's what probably made me a better player, you know, when I got into the open ranks. So we're gonna go back and uh, dissect the 1962 Grand Slam oh. for the first time. We'll probably do this on television. You've done it numerous occasions. Rod Laver won the Grand Slam in 62, winning all four in the same calendar year. The first male player to do it since Don Budge in 1938. Mm -hmm. But when you look back at those four championship matches, which would you have considered the toughest one? Probably the, the, the clay the clay court in the, at the French is probably for all Australians. It, you're not familiar with the, the, the way the ball bounces, the slowness of it, keeping it. You might be very much very aware of the clay courts and being able to understand how to play on the stuff. And just because the ball is sitting up there soft, yeah. you, you really can't hit it for a winner. 
you know, you've got to you've got to work the point a lot more. Other than that, I think Wimbledon is 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 probably the toughest. But 62, when you when you won the first three and you went into the U.S. Open, uh, did you have that? on your mind thinking, my goodness, I have an opportunity now to win the Grand Slam? Yes, it was there, but it, it, it didn't, the pressure didn't seem to be building on me to, because I, I never got anywhere near the press at the US Open at Forest Hills. It was on grass, which yeah. was probably, you know, a pet surface for, for me back in those years, because that was mainly, yeah. everything was on grass, uh, except the French. And so I found myself going in there with a, you know, Okay, they, well, they, you, you guys have got to beat me, and that, that's <laughs> yeah. that's as far as I took it. Right. And and I think, yeah, you know, yes, I trained hard. You know, I got my, I didn't have injuries, but no, I I think I probably played some of my best tennis in in all four times. So when you uh, now you turned pro thereafter, and then you went on to play, kind of left the Grand Slam circuit for a while, obviously because it was still amateur tennis. Mm -hmm. And you look back and you think. Now, if I had stayed with it, I could have won more Grand Slams. Does that thought come to your mind? I could have added another dozen, perhaps. <laughs> it only comes to me after the fact when someone says, well, you could have done, you have, could, could probably you could have won a couple more Grand Slams, you know, just individual tournaments. And, you know, I, I, I really felt like, you know, where was amateur tennis going? You know, open tennis certainly was, was voted out. And I'm thinking... I, I've got to earn a living somewhere. And so I elected to turn pro with Hoden Rosewall. And of course, there was Sedgman and there was a bunch of other, Buckles, McKay. And, and I, I, I felt good about the decision. But like you say, you know, yes, it's probably possible I would have, would have found a few more trophies because I missed 20, 20 Grand Slams, you know, in, in, in those years. But fortunately, you know, Open Tennis came in 68. So I was, I was 30, 31. And so I yeah, had that opportunity to get back at Wimbledon again, which was a thrill. Which was amazing. And of course, you beat uh, Tony Roach, if I memory serves me correctly, in that 68 final right. uh, for the first uh, Open Wimbledon that we saw. And prize money was handed to you for the first time at the championships at Wimbledon, along with that great trophy. Now, just fast forward to that 69. And in 1969, you performed the impossible, which was winning the Grand Slam now in the Open Era. Right. The only player to this day, as we speak, to still be the first and only male player to win the Grand Slam in the Open Era. You know, it really doesn't doesn't hit me that way. You know, when when I walk on a court, I'm there, I'm there uh, and if the more of the pressure occasion, I seem to not, don't get nervous. You, you get a little bit of the, you know, the jitters walking on the court, but that's when my concentration is the best. And so I always played my best tennis in the finals. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, I was just, and sometimes I admire that in me, but th there's times when you think, well, you know, what, what do you think about? But I always thought it's one tournament at a time. Went down to Australia in, in 69 and I played, uh, you know, played in Brisbane, pretty much my hometown. And I, and I, I thought to myself, you know, Maybe I, you know, it'd be fun to play. This is the first tournament that would be open because they, you know, Australia missed out, yes. you know, because it was a mid mid year decision, and so the final year. So I found myself just saying, "Well, this would be fun." Also, my wife t called up and says that she was pregnant and she was going to be due at the final in September. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so, Tough choice. <laughs> so it, it, you know, it was sort of a combination of yes. things, but it was purely, you know. Yes, I did it in 62, but in 69, it was open and, and it, 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 well, just see how I go. I'm, I'm just going to train accordingly. And if I can, if I can, oh, I shouldn't say do it again, but if I can win, a, win two or three of these Grand Slams, yes. this is my first chance to do it again. When you look back, and people always talk about the great Rod Laver and uh, his ability to hit winners when the chips were down. And uh, that's not something that you can actually teach someone who's growing up. You know, you, your guy tends to be cautious. We come from a part of the world where we tend to be a lot more cautious about things. We, we like doing things the right way. We are very cautious about the way we put our feet and so on and so forth. So even sometimes in sport, we're not as aggressive as we per perhaps should be. Mm -hmm. And you were exactly the opposite. You went for broke. 30-40, took a chance. You went for broke. And uh, majority of the time, the winners came came to you. Is that something that you taught yourself or was it sort of inbuilt in you? 
No, I guess it was built in. You know, I, you know, I always felt that you know, hitting, you know, hitting, hitting out at age 12, 14, 15, and yeah, I was, I was hitting those a lot of those balls into the cheap seats <laughs> when you know I should, I should have been just getting them. A, and of course, you know, Harry Hopman and you know my coach Charlie Hollis would be thinking, you know. Ah, leave him alone. If, if they if they start going in because you know he, he taught me how to hit a backhand with a topspin backhand rather than with lefties were notorious with a, just a slice backhand chip and not being able to be effective. And he says you'll never win Wimbledon when you when you chip the ball. You got to hit through the shot. And I think that some of those things probably you know pushed me into into going for more than I should go to. Uh, when you look back at your career. Uh is there someone that stands out in your mind, the best player that you would have played against, or someone you feared that even if you played well enough, he was still going to get you? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that happened to me when I turned pro, because when I got uh, Lou Hode was always my idol. Yes, I grew up being able to see Lou and Rosewall, you know, but he was always just unbelievable. Strength in his shots, his anticipation, his timing of the ball, everything was just immaculate. He didn't do as well as he probably could have, even though he, he did well in his own own career. But he just didn't care as much about the game. And, and he thought, I played him seven matches in uh, Australia when I turned pro, and uh, he beat me every time. I won a few sets, but that, that was as far as he'd let me go. He says, I'll teach that little uh, <laughs> you know, how to play this game. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, but those Rosewall, I spent a lot of time with on the regular tour. Of course, the, the WCT final when I played Rosewall, we went to a tiebreaker in the fifth set, and he he, he, he beat up on me. You know, I wouldn't say beat up on me, but he he won it. Went down to the last, <laughs> went down to the wire. If you all remember that match, those of you who are too young to remember that match way back in <laughs> 1971 and 72, they played each other in the final of the World Championship tennis final there in uh, five sets and went down to the last couple of points in the tiebreaker, Lever and Rosewall. Why do those matches go down as probably the, arguably the greatest matches that were played? Purely the tension. And I, you know, today's players, it's a, it's a different world out there, but with little wooden headed rackets, you know, you, 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 you can't do the things that were easy to do, you know, with a metal racket. So, you know, I think I, you know, I think we, we had, we had great matches, but you know, it was it was a, it was a slow game. You know, it was a slower game. Yes, I was trying to hit out a lot more because I always wanted the ball deeper. That was where I was going. But I, you know, I made a lot of mistakes doing that. But uh, you know, but it was it was a good match. And you know, yes, I was disappointed in not being able to win that, getting so close. But you know, I congratulate Kenny. He's an unbelievable tennis player. Hold and Gonzalez, two of the finest you've seen. I I would say both of them because they. They went on a 100-match series back in, uh, well, when Tur Lou turned pro in 57, you know, to see Gonzalez and Hode playing out. It was just, it was incredible. You know, Gonzalez with that huge serve, the backhands of Hode, you know, it was it was great, great tennis. And it was ding-dong battle all the way through, you know, to, the, to those matches. But, you know, I think it was, it was just one of those, you know, great times that you saw two people at their best. So we're going to fast forward now to modern modern times <clears throat> and uh, the Australian Open, which is now truly one of the finest Grand Slams we can have on television anywhere in the world. The center court there is the Rod Laver Arena, mm -hmm. and rightly so. And uh, I think it is just a tribute to what, not just the fact that you're Australian, but to tennis itself. How does it make you feel when you walk into the Rod Laver Arena? Well, you know, it's, it's quite incredible to think that, uh, you know, my career warranted, you know, something like this and to have have the, the people in Australia, you know, just enjoying it. You know, of course, as, as you can say, it's, it's only been, it's only a tennis court for about three weeks. The rest of the time, there's concerts. They had a world swim meet there. <laughs> so it's been pretty incredible. Yes. So, I, you know, I really cherish the honour that was, bestowed upon me by having the name Rod Laver on that arena. So it, it really is a, you know, a crowning jewel of my career. 
So when you look at look back now at <laughs> Australian tennis and where it is today, and you see that to a great extent, you know, after Laver and Rosewall and, and Newcomb and Roach and and then Alexander and Dent and Case and Masters, and we we started to sort of uh, dilute it, if 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 you want to use that <laughs> word. But where are we today after Leighton won Wimbledon in 2002, I think it was, okay. and thereafter in Leighton's career, Leighton Hewitt. Uh, where do you think Australian tennis is now and what should they do in their pursuit of excellence? Generally, the Australians, when they, when they came out during my era, they, they came out of little towns like Tarkata mm -hmm. with Tony Roach. You know, if you're going to Theodore, you know, it's Mal Anderson. Mm -hmm. Black, you know, Black Butt is Roy Emerson's town. I'm from Rockhampton, so you know. Wonder why this happens. Mm -hmm. Maybe the country folk are, are prepared to put maybe that little bit more into the game. If you're given a chance to 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 end up and and try and travel over around the world and be a tennis player, mm -hmm. maybe that's sort of a help. Today, you know, we've got we've got a good group of players that are that are up now and running, and and t Tony Roach and John Newcomb and Jeff Masters. There's a whole group of people that are trying to push. The young ones, you know, they're, they're yeah. You know, we've got we've got good good players like Kanakas and Tukanaka. Uh, you know, there's a you know, Roth, and and so you've got to get that competition to to make it you know fire. And now the guys are winning and sometimes getting to the quarters or semifinals, so they're getting that experience. So you hope that that whole group will continue to fight and and be good at it. So let's talk about the, the great players today who won pretty much uh, most of the major singles championships. The Federer, Nadal, Djokovic, Murray obviously stand out. You've got Wawrinka now who has done some serious damage as we saw him play in the French final against Djokovic. But when you look at these guys, uh, does anyone have it in there now to potentially win the actual calendar Grand Slam? You know, I, I think, I think uh, Djokovic has got every chance he was he was up in the final in the french and i would have thought he was odds on to beat Warinka in the in the final and that would have given him two he's certainly in after the fact but he's won wimbledon he'd be going to the u.s open with with the fourth one yeah is was was serena williams who's going for the fourth <laughs> one he's actually going for it this year so you know i i think there's there's been players there i i actually thought Bjorn Borg, back in his his heyday, why wouldn't he win the Grand Slam? He could play on the clay, he could play on the grass, you know. He, but he, for some reason, his retirement was a little earlier than he should have been. Boris Becker could have gone through. It's Pete Sampras. I mean, there was a lot of them there. But you know, sometimes you're not motivated. Sometimes you know injuries can come about, and so you you. You always sort of think, what, what if today, you know, you're, you're looking at, uh, you know, I think certainly Jokovic is, is, is certainly the favourite to go through, but maybe it won't be too long, three or four years. There's another great champion on the horizon. When you look back at your career, do you think there are things that you could have done differently? No, there really isn't. I don't think there's <laughs> a certain, because, you know, I, I look at my career and I sort of, you know, yeah, to have won Wimbledon four times, you know, to be able to, you know, have that uh, that on under your belt, you know, it, it's 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 a thrill just going back there to see what the new players are trying to accomplish, and you know, see, seeing Roger Federer and and Djokovic play that final this year, you know, and I think Roger, along with myself, thought he he could, he could maybe win this thing to, and create another Grand Slam for himself. So. You know, there's a there's a lot of players out there that, you know, you know, that came along and, and a lot came along, you know, at one time. You got Nadal who's having a little bit of a lapsed time now with you know, he's had some injuries, so he's not playing his best tennis at the moment. Hopefully he'll be able to find his niche again and, and get back onto that top level. Because, you know, tennis needs not just two people up there. They need maybe four or five people up. You know, Murray is certainly capable of, of doing well. Now, I know you've always been very competitive and uh, I've seen you on the golf course as well on the odd <laughs> occasion. Um, you are a very good golfer. Are you competitive when you play golf? I, I don't know as I'm as competitive as maybe on the tennis court. 
because uh, yeah, otherwise I'd be on the on the, down on the range <laughs> practicing all the time. But but I yeah, I, I enjoyed it. It's more of a relaxing out attitude for me to get out there and play some and with with friends, whether it be Charlie Passarell or Cliff Drysdale, you know, that group. We all go out. Yes, we have some friendly bets, but but nothing that creates pressure. It's more friendship and yes. just the way they hit the ball. Uh, the reason I bring up the golf is because I remember one year in Cincinnati and my golf is, is, is very, very amateur golf. But I remember you didn't have your clubs with you and you, you took my clubs and gave me whatever strokes I needed and still <laughs> took me to the cleaners. <laughs> well, I'm, it must, I must have had a good day. <laughs> because it, it, is, it is a wonderful outlet. Yeah, it's, it's the scenery. It's it's the it's, it's it's a new game, so it's a challenge. You know, thinking well, you don't know how to do half these shots, and and you and you you, you watch the pros play. You know, watching Jason Day yes. play yesterday, well, in the British Open, Australian, uh, the, the PGA, PGA, and I'm just I marvel at how they can play so accurately, and of course. Hitting a ball 375 yards and a drive, you know, I don't identify with any of this. <laughs> That's very true. That's very true. But when you look at tennis today and you see the, the difference, as you just pointed out in golf, and you see the changes that have taken place in tennis, uh, not just with equipment, but also with the balls, the surface, the serve and volley sort of has stepped off the grass court tennis. The surfaces have become slower. The balls have become heavier. Uh, is that good for the game? Oh, I wouldn't have thought the ball was any heavier, but the way the, the, the tall guys at six four, six eight, are all firing the serves at 135, 100 and up to 140, probably a little bit more the big ones. But yeah, it, it, it's unbelievable that the amount of quality players that are, that are actually on the circuit as of today. And, and you can go down that list yeah. to, to 40, and any one of them could win the tournament. And I think that's that's got to be good for the game to yeah. see that, you know, I, you know, our our wooden rackets against the composites and the you know the metal, you know, yes, there's a few things that, you know, I think that the ATP and tennis has to look into, and that might be the serve. How do you, how do you take control of the serve so it becomes more of a game rather than the big serves because Isner. If I played him on the, he served to me on the second court, and with the bounce that he's got on the ball, <laughs> it goes over my ten, my foot, my head by ten feet. So I mean, is that good for the game? And I, I'm, I'm thinking, well, someone said one time, he says, just, just eliminate it to one serve, not, not two serves. And so you have to slow it up to get, get them in. But I mean, there's all sorts of little things that probably you can play with, you know. Certainly, I didn't know the ball had been made heavier now to try and implement some more rallies. And, you know, of course, the, the variety of play over the, you know, the wooden element with all the players that we, I was with, and then you see today's players, there's very little drop shots. It's generally a serve and just weight, heavy ground strokes, not much serve and volley. I know Federer was certainly trying to change that so he could, he could learn, learn the volleying game, which he did. Final two questions, Rocket. Um, what do you enjoy doing most now <clears throat> as you go from tournament to tournament, do some appearances, play golf? But what does Rocket like to do now? Look back at his career, of course, see the guys playing today. But what do you enjoy? I still enjoy watching the, watching the game. Yeah, you know, that's, especially if I go to Wimbledon, you know, I don't go sit somewhere and and say, well, yeah, I'll, I'll be at somewhere for lunch or dinner or whatever. I, I just, if I'm in the, in the Royal, invited to the Royal Box, I spend there all afternoon and watch every match that's on there, whether it be men, women. And, and I think, to me, that's, that's, a, good, that's a good day. But when, you, when you're looking at you know, your, your career and, you know, it's, it's, it, it's nice to look back and, and know that, yes, I was out there one time and, you know, enjo enjoyed that element. But it is, you know, I've got a, a son that's here, but I think the real you know, person is my granddaughter is 14 and she's a, a soccer player. She's the goalie and is, you know, it's just a thrill to be around 
And so I go to a lot of her games, and I think that's that's sort of a thrill. In later, later life, you see that 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 creeps into your game, and then all of a sudden, you know, you, you're looking forward to that Saturday when they're playing soccer. So I guess I, maybe I'm, I'm old hat, but I just like the family atmosphere. That's absolutely brilliant. If you had to pick one aspect or two aspects in, in someone's pursuit of excellence, what would you sort of put your finger on? If it's if it's not a body, it's what you do. I think you know it, it's it's the presence that you 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 leave somebody. Yeah, you know, if you leave this world, and you said this is what I've done, you know, I'm proud of what I've done, and I think that should be the same for everybody. Is that you know, don't leave anything left on the table. Just, you know, do what you can, enjoy what you do, and the main thing is to enjoy life. That's so very true. I always say I was very fortunate to have played during the era of the great Rod Laver, and to me that was a real blessing to have played during your time. Well, it was a, it was a, a blessing for me to be able to go to India and, and see what you've done with the juniors down there. Thank you. They're just terrific. And then, of course, I have to remember the 1968, where you get beaten. 73, first, actually. 73? <laughs> yes. Wow, well, boy. 73. You were older then. <laughs> <laughs> See, yeah, my memory gets me now, but playing you at Forest Hills on the grass, and it was, it was, it's been some challenges, yeah. but it was sort of been fun too. Rocket, thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate you being on Louis Philippe in Pursuit of Excellence. Thank you. Thanks very much. You can also watch this episode online at louisphilippe.com.